My name is Brian Tile, and I'm the Director of Membership for ASCB, and I also serve as the Staff Liaison for the International Affairs Committee, which has organized these three sessions. Uh, today, I want to thank you for being with us to, to hear from our panelists, and I want to thank our panelists for being here with us today. Uh, we are going to hear from Brazil, Niels Olson Saravea Camara, which I hope I pronounced correctly, uh, Fernando Leite from uh, Portugal, and Luba Taramori from Jordan. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Niels, so please go away. Okay, so thanks, Brian. Um, thanks everyone for this nice invitation. It's a pleasure to be here today and present some um, data information about my university. So my name is Niels Kamara. I am a full professor of immunology. For the last eight months, I am working as a deputy provost for graduate studies at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, the University of Sao Paulo is uh, uh, the biggest university in South America. We are well ranked in uh, uh, several ranks uh, that measure this activity of this university, like KS, THA. Uh, we have around almost 100,000 students, if you consider the undergrad and graduate students, and more or less 5,000 staff. We are divided in eight different campus. Um, in all the states of Sao Paulo, they're here in the southeast of our country. Uh, the University of Sao Paulo have more than 40 eight libraries, we have four hospitals, and we are divided in units that we call institute, college, and museums. If you consider just the graduate students, uh, here in Brazil, in our university, uh, the, 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 the students are dividing programs. So USP has a huge number of programs, 267 programs, and we just finished a four years evaluation and we are having more than 50% of this program that are considered excellence. They have uh, an international uh, visibility and um, a competence in the research and training that they do. We have in just in the graduate studies around 30,000 students. And since the beginning in the 17th, we already graded 165,000 titles for master and PhD. These programs here, they are divided in at least five main areas um, that we use them to select the students and to offer disciplines and uh, fellowships and uh, 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 mobility abroad and inside Brazil. We call translational plant and animal science, health and disease, earth and space, art and humanities, and technology. Uh, USP, in this um, year, we have a new chancellor, and we are discussing how much our work here uh, should be connected to the SDG. So uh, if you consider this last more or less 10 years that we are working here at USP, we see that the university is producing a high quality research in at least four different um, goals, like zero hunger, affordable health, life before water, and life on land. So this is very important because uh, uh, all projects that we are uh, designing and do doing here must be connected to this SDG and uh, uh, this must be something that we are going to do for the next four years uh, in this term of this new chancellor. So we are very much uh, interested in giving to the students uh, a way that their project in master and in PhD must be connected to a global question or society questions here in a country like Brazil that uh, needs so much of the university to deal with some challenging uh, uh, that we face here. So this idea is now our key mode uh, to guide uh, what we are trying to, to do with these uh, students. So we wonder and we want them to connect 
uh, the project with the society and to have a very uh, multidisciplinary and dynamic project. To do this, we are just connected with several other offices here at UPSP, the international office, the research office, uh, and also the intellectual uh, property agency that take care of all these issues related to uh, uh, entrepreneurship. And also we are connected with some companies where the students can actually do part of their, uh, their study in a private session. So with this, uh, they can actually be more close to the society. So in this idea, we think that uh, this new way to that the PhD and the master students should look to their projects is giving them new abilities. And we are to, um, making a lot of effort to, to teach them uh, some innovation leadership to so they can acquire some intercultural competences here at USP and also connected with other university, uh, some soft skills, and most importantly, they know how to communicate with society. Society needs to know and to understand what we are doing here uh, in closed doors, in our unities and uh, in their labs. So we are very happy that we start a project together with QS, Exeter, Hong Kong, Chinese Hong Kong University, Stellenbosch and Auckland. Um, be part of a project that is called Future 17, that is part of the, we are trying to do with these new students, where they can, the students can form teams and then can answer questions from the SDG uh, and after three, four months, they can come up with an idea uh, how to figure it out on problem that comes from company, but also comes from society. So this is just an idea, the way we are looking now uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, for these students. So as I said to you, USP is a very comprehensive university. We have more than 267 programs. They are divided in humanities, life science, engineer, law, social science. Um, every year we have some program that can be a new program or some other program that just fuse in a different program. That's why this number sometimes is variable. But in all areas of knowledge, and as I said, most of them have a degree of excellence. And it's very important that here, in Brazil and especially in Sao Paulo State, we have some uh, agency that can actually fund students to come over uh, and do some research here in Brazil. CNPQ and CAPS, they are a federal agency. They have opportunity for students uh, uh, for postdocs, PhD uh, 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 here in Brazil, and sometimes also master's students. Uh, FINEP is also a state university. They actually uh, pay and uh, support uh, the projects and the infrastructure for projects. Uh, in the state of Sao Paulo, we have a very strong agency called FAPESP. FAPESP is very keen to, uh, to support foreign students to come over in Brazil to do their PhD here, master and postdoc. So they have a fellowship that covers everything, health insurance, um, uh, travel expense, and the stipendium, the monthly stipendium here. And here at USP, we have an agreement between FAPESP and the university to receive students that they can use the GRA uh, scores. Uh, uh, and with these scores, they can actually enter in any PhD program here uh, at USP just doing the same thing that they do for other university. And they, if they manage to do this, they can, they receive a four years fellowship from FAPESP. So this is also something very interesting. So we believe that uh, USP is very attractive for foreign students because we have some expertise uh, uh, here in the region, South America, Latin America. And here are some examples that we, uh, made very good progress and we have this international visibility like the last uh, endemic uh, by Zika virus. Now in coronavirus, we were one of the universities that published the highest number of papers on coronavirus. 
Also, uh, USP has a, a center to, st to study green carbon agriculture and also green energy. So this is very uh, unique here at our university and sometimes very um, attractive for foreign students to, to, to acquire some knowledge and to share some, uh, 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 some ideas. So also here at USP, we've foster that the students can get a double degree abroad. Uh, we have more than 100 universities that, that we have the agreements to do a double degree, but I just put here free universe that we have what we call global dual degree agreements. It means that any students from any areas of knowledge can get a double degree with Groningen, Munster, or uh, University of Lisbon. So this is very interesting. We have now, uh, this is a major uh, issue that we are fostering and uh, working to have more universities uh, to do this double degree. Uh, so we are in all social media. Uh, we can find some information in our website or you can actually also email us and we'll be happy to, to discuss and send some uh, information about the university. Thank you, Brian. Great, thank you very much. So uh, we're definitely have time for questions. So if anybody has any questions, please do uh, post in the Q&A uh, button down at the bottom, the lower uh, part of the screen. And uh, we'll certainly uh, have opportunities for questions. Uh, while people are uh, posting their questions, I, I have a, a couple of questions to start. You know, uh, is there, uh, to what degree, is there a, a language barrier uh, of people who do not have the native speaking of Portuguese and they're coming to the country or uh, can you discuss that a little bit? Very good question, Brian. Indeed. So uh, Fernanda and I, we have this in common. So in Brazil, uh, the language is Portuguese. So most of the disciplines and course are taught in Portuguese. But for the last five years, we are supporting disciplines and uh, there were teaching in English. So you can find here in any program some disciplines that we can, the students can uh, attend the disciplines and they will be uh, in English. If you go to the labs and units, you can speak English uh, fluently. So this is not a major issue, but it, uh, it's still the percentage of disciplines uh, that are uh, offer in English is, is still less than, of course, in Portuguese. But USP is increasing uh, annually the the list of disciplines that can actually the students can uh, uh, can just do while they are doing the master, the PhD. I forgot to tell you, but it's a nice opportunity to to say that uh, we have, as I said, 30,000 students in master and PhD, and we have around 8% of them from abroad. So this is a, it's not a, a huge number, but it is increasing year after year. So we are just getting better to receive those students here. Great. What, what about outside of the university? Um... Yeah, so uh, if you consider Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo is the biggest university, uh, the biggest city here in Brazil. It's a cosmopolitan city like New York and so on. So you can use, uh, uh, you can speak English and you can find uh, yourself in the city with no problem. Uh, transportation, you can see double language in Portuguese and English. So uh, specifically in Sao Paulo, this is not a, uh, an issue. Absolutely. Uh, is there a particular timetable throughout the year that is best to apply for things? Yeah, very good question. Most of the programs they have uh, for the master students, they have twice a year uh, open uh, calls for the master. For the PhD, uh, you can actually be enrolled any time of the year. As well, uh, you can ask for a fellowship from FAPESP. This is the best fellowship. It's almost twice uh, the as the fellowship from CAPES or CNPQ. And the fellowship from PAPESP, you can actually ask when you are abroad. And if you receive the fellowship for PAPESP, you will actually pay your travel to come over. And you can ask, uh, you can 
uh, start the process any time a year. So there is a continu continuous flow, I mean, any time. Right. And we do have a question from the audience. Uh, is a research proposal required for PhD cancer biology? Yeah. So uh, uh, again, so the way it works here in Brazil and at the University of Sao Paulo, each program that you can be in, uh, enrolled is autonomous to decide how is the registration. So normally, uh, uh, we request some uh, uh, that you have a, 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 a knowledge in the area and you can discuss with a potential supervisor about a project, something like this. Uh, specifically in the cancer research, uh, as I said, we have eight campus here and two major campus in Sao Paulo in Ribeirão Preto. They have a very high productive and um, uh, competitive and dynamic research in this area. So, but anyone, um, each one, they have specific uh, uh, requirement for the students. So we need to connect with them to say what are the specific uh, issues that each program uh, are asking for the students. Thanks. Uh, one final question for me is, uh, how competitive is the application process? What what percentage of applicants from outside of uh, Brazil are accepted in the programs? So again, thanks, Brian. So when you apply for a fellowship from FAPESP, you're going to be judged in three levels, your supervisor, uh, your CV, and the project. Uh, and you you're going to have a, a, a grade for each one. And at the end, you have an overall grade that uh, FAPESP used to compare because it's a pair uh, revision. And then uh, they decide which one we'll get. Today, uh, for a, a, a PhD uh, student, is around 33% of chance to get it. It's higher than any other of this agency that we see abroad from US and Europe. It is still very high. So uh, if you come up with a very nice idea, if your idea is uh, innovative, uh, uh, if you have a CV uh, with some articles, presentation in Congress, something like this, so you're gonna be very competitive, but you're gonna get it. Uh, you just have to present a very strong uh, proposal in this free main subject. Great, and we actually do have one more question from the audience. Uh, is there an age limit that can apply? No limit. Uh, there is no age limit. So you can apply if no, no problem. The only thing here that FAPESP, specifically FAPESP, has a problem with age that you can only apply for a postdoc from FAPESP uh, up to seven years after your PhD. After that, you, you are no longer able uh, to apply for a postdoc, but not PhD or master, okay? Great. Thank you very much. Nilsa. Thank you, it. Brian. Thank you. Okay, next we're going to hear from Fernanda from Portugal. Okay. Um, as a member of the International Affairs Committee uh, from the American Society for Cell Biology, ACB, I want to thank uh, Brian and uh, the ACB for uh, inviting me to speak a little bit about Portugal and research in Portugal and cell biology. Uh, I want to say hello to the other panelists, Nils Alson and uh, Lubna. Tata Muni and uh, the, uh, the rest of the audience. Thank you. So Portugal is a European country with, uh, uh, after the latest United Nations data with more than 10 million of population. Uh, we have a median age of uh, 46 years old and 60% uh, of the population speak a second language, mostly English. 
um, from the main Portuguese universities with undergraduate programs and uh, R&D institutions in science and health, the two best uh, universities in Portugal ranked based on their research performance in biology is in first place uh, the University of Porto and second place uh, the uh, University of Coimbra. The The main uh, institutions that uh, in Portugal are doing cell biology and um, most of them are classified as excellent by the Portuguese regulatory agency are uh, four institutes at the University of Porto, Institute for Cell and Molecular Cell Biology, Institute of Molecular Pathology and Immunology that is concerned to the cancer research, the I3S, that's, uh, that's my affiliation, the Institute of Research and Innovation in Health, is the largest uh, uh, research institution in Portugal. It's a clustering of research that uh, we have uh, uh, shared goals and shared interest in health research. And we empower the technology and we share technology and expertise in different uh, fields of science. Then we have two big uh, um, uh, research groups uh, in from the University of Minho, Braga, it's on the north. Um, the three Bs that stands for biomaterials, biodegradables, and biomimetics. They are uh, an European reference group for uh, regenerative medicine and scaffolds. And Life and Health Science uh, Research Institute is also uh, cell biology uh, reference uh, research group here in Portugal. I'm sorry, uh, uh, can I just interrupt you real, real quick for a minute? I'm sorry, uh, we're not able to see your slides. You are not able to see? We cannot, we're only seeing the introductory page uh, slide. Oh. Let's see. Okay, now we're seeing, we're seeing one now. It's not in presentation mode though. Is there it, we go, thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, so, the, do you want me to begin? No, 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 no. Okay. So, I was uh, speaking about uh, now from the University of Coimbra. We have the Center for Neuroscience and Cell Biology. And uh, we have four institutes in Lisbon from the University of Lisbon, the Institute of Molecular Medicine, the Chemical Biological Technology Institute, the Science Gulbenkian Institute, and Champalima Foundation. And from the University of, um, of Algarve, we have the Structural and Molecular Biomedicine uh, Research Center. Considering uh, doctoral training in cell biology uh, PhD programs, we have uh, seven programs. Three of them are from the responsibility of the University of Porto. The first one that we see here is a partnership between a, a public medicine faculty and the science faculty of the University of Porto. And this, the genetics and, uh, and molecular medicine and oncology programs, PhD programs, are from the uh, faculty of medicine of University of Porto. Coimbra uh, from the Neuroscience Center, Research Center, is responsible for the experimental biology and biomedicine PhD studies. And um, uh, in Lisbon, we have three more PhD programs uh, from the responsibility of the Gulbenkian Institute, from the um, uh, Chemical and the Bio Biological Technology Institute, and from the Molecular Medicine Institute. Uh, this is a website, it's a, a search engine for um, uh, uh, scholarship and uh, research jobs. And if we can put uh, a keyword like postdoc 
study in cell biology and choose Portugal, we have this uh, interface and we know that we have three positions for postdoc, um, uh, in, one in Champolino Foundation, another in the Faculty of Engineering of University of Porto, and another in the, the science, the Gobenkian Institute. Um, considering funding, uh, we have national funding and European funding. Uh, the national funding is uh, can be public or private. The public is uh, uh, related to the Portuguese Foundation uh, to Science and Technology, the FCT, that covers all the scientific domains and is under the responsibility of the Ministry for Science, Technology and Higher Education. Considering private uh, uh, funding, we have the most important Bayel Foundation. We have the partnership between the Portuguese government and the American government, the Fulbright and the Luso American Foundation. Uh, we have the Portugal 2020, uh, the Pfizer Portugal, the Calusto Gulbenk Foundation, Champalima Foundation, and the Foundation La Caixa in Portugal. European funding, we all know that we have EMBO, the European Molecular Biology Organization, that is a partnership also do, to the SCB. The uh, Council Research European also gives grants uh, supporting researchers independently of their nationality or age to pursue uh, frontier research. We have the Marie Curie actions. They are available uh, to the researchers regardless of uh, field of research. And um, the Joint Research Center, that is a, a doctorate, I'm sorry, a general doctorate of, of the European Commission that employs scientists to, to uh, um, perform research and to give answers and support the European uh, Union policy. Um, the Access Portugal and Science Portugal, they are portals, uh, the websites with centralized information on available jobs, opening calls and science initiatives. Uh, they give support uh, even for researchers that are moving to or from Portugal and to their families also to stay in Portugal. The 10 top reasons for choosing Portugal and this is an image of a red cardiomyocyte. Um, this is the best European residence program for non-European investors. We have a minimal stay requirement after five years, uh, it's possible to obtain the permanent residence or the citizenship. Uh, we have a 10-year tax exception uh, for the non-Portuguese source income and is one of the top countries to buy and own real estate. Um, we have uh, several awards for best destination by the World Travel Awards and the best country in Europe in North American for immigrant integration after the score of MIPEX uh, 3. Um, good roads, telecommunication, and we we'll have the, the 12th best health system all, all the while, according to the uh, WHO. Uh, very high quality of life coupled with low cost of living. Uh, as I mentioned before, a highly educated population, more 60% of our population speak second language, mostly English. A gateway to uh, 280 million uh, Portuguese speaking people and a very peaceful and safe country. This is the third uh, peaceful worldwide according to the Peace Index, uh, Global Peace Index uh, score. Thank you. Thank you, Brian and Doc. Oops. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Fernanda. Uh, so again, questions were welcome in the in the QA tab at the bottom. Uh, let me ask you first. Uh, Fernanda, how difficult is it to obtain public funding in Portugal? Um, is it very difficult? It's not easy. Uh, in the year of 2021, 
we had a rate of 8.7% uh, of the approval uh, of the projects approved. Uh, I've been awarded, uh, but it's not very easy. It's very, very complicated because um, it's a very competitive uh, application. So we had uh, more than uh, 4,700 applications and only 555 uh, projects were approved by the FCT. It's the public, it's a little bit complicated, but it's more easy uh, to the private to, to have a good uh, funding, but it's not uh, very, uh, yes, public, it's not very easy. Okay. How much does it cost for a PhD program? Um, for the cell biology pro PhD programs, it's uh, 2,750 euros per year, I, I mean, uh, annually. And every year, the four-year PhD program, uh, it's the same. Because in other countries, for example, in the United States, in Harvard, the two years are much more uh, costly that that then the the third and fourth year, yeah, it's not and uh, we have uh, a special statute for foreign uh, students. Uh, we have, um, for example, if you are from the uh, uh, speaking um, speaking um, population, Portuguese uh, population like uh, uh, Mozambique, uh, Brazil. We have um, a discount of almost forty-five percent um, that uh, we can have. Uh, those students uh, they don't pay so much. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So as I asked uh, Niels as well, what is there a particular timing throughout the year when it's best to apply? Well, we have uh, um, in contrary to Brazil, we have um, schedules to apply. Uh, we can have two seasons to apply for a PhD program um, because it's a centralized uh, at least at each faculty and um, we, you have to apply at the uh, in July and in September uh, to apply for the PhD at least in cell biology is like that. Mm -hmm. And what about the language barrier issue? Uh, um, no, it's not a barrier because, for example, I give classes uh, to the faculty and my classes uh, sometimes I have to speak all in English because there are some students that are not speaking. Uh, we have already Ukrainian students. I have already Ukrainian in my classes that comes from Ukraine, from uh, running from the refugees, they are refugees. And I, I must speak in English for them. And uh, everyone understands because all the students, uh, they read English, they study in English. And my slides are in English all the time. And so uh, th there's no barrier, no. Right. And in the lab, everyone speaks in English. The person, the staff that are related to it, science and research, is, uh, it's normal. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Fernanda. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our, our next speaker from Jordan is Lubna. Hi, Brian. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, uh, Ms. Martin yeah. has to share it for you. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Can you see my screen? Oh, not, you are breaking up now. Oh, we could see your screen. You can put it back up. You may just need to turn your camera off for a second. Oh, okay. So, um, Ms. Oh, okay. You can. Okay. Oh, yeah, I will.
Okay. Um, can you see it now? Yes. Just go into presentation mode. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm not sure. So, so because this is not my. my Okay, um, so um, thank you for ACB for hosting this. Um, uh, as Brian mentioned, I'm from Jordan. Uh, I, this is how I like to uh, start usually is by pointing out where Jordan is. It's a very, very tiny country in the Middle East, but this, is, uh, this webinar is very interesting for you know, sharing uh, uh, experiences from researchers from Europe as well as from uh, Americas as uh, well as in Jordan. Um, so Jordan is a very, very tiny country. The population uh, is 10 million, but as you can see from the figures, we have 3 million refugees. Uh, it's a very interesting country. Uh, I just need to know if you can hear me or not. We can, keep going. Okay, so can we go to that uh, in presentation mode, please? Uh, yeah, again, because this is not my presentation, so um, Smartin has go. to go. Okay, thank you. Very good, thank can you. We go to, okay, so again, Jordan is a very interesting country. We are 10 million people living in this tiny country, but the figure, as you can see, we have 7 million Jordanians and 3 million refugees, which put a lot of economic burden on, uh, on Jordan. Next slide, please. Okay, um, it's a very young country. 30% uh, of the population is under the age of 30. Uh, only 3% th um, are considered senior. So over the age of 65, it's a very, very young, uh, very young country. But again, it's, it's under a lot of economic uh, burden. Next slide, please. please. Um, we cherish education. Uh, the illiteracy um, percentage in Jordan is less than 7%. So almost everybody in Jordan can uh, write and read. If almost uh, everywhere you go, uh, people can speak, uh, can speak uh, English. Uh, again, we cherish uh, education. Um, the figures, it depends on who's doing the surveys, but uh, like if the government is doing the surveys, uh, one statistic is that more than 30% of the population in Jordan is pursuing their um, undergraduate uh, studies. According to the UN, it's almost 15%. Uh, and I think they, they consider the refugees as part of that survey. Uh, so next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have, again, because as I said, we cherish education, we have more than 30 universities in this uh, tiny country. We have uh, 11 uh, public universities. Uh, I teach in one of these public universities. It is in there in red. It is called the Hashemite University. And um, we have more than 20 uh, private, uh, private universities. So again, as I said, uh, we cherish education and Jordan because of its limited resources, um, we depend on education uh, for uh, foreigners, especially at the undergraduate level, and as well as uh, health. Uh, we have we are the hub for um, medications and uh, surgeries in the Middle East. Next, please. Oh, the other way. Okay. Yeah. So again, more than 20. Um, yeah. So um, let's focus on the okay. let's focus on the PhD. Um, um, again, uh, education is a uh, it's a very uh, high resource economic and financial resource for Jordan. 
we have in the different 31 uh, universities in Jordan, we have more than 35,000 faculty and staff members. We have more than a quarter of a million of undergraduate uh, students and 18,000 graduate students. Uh, the PhD level, next slide, please. Uh, the PhD, um, no, next, yeah. At the PhD level, this is where we fall short. Um, only a few universities uh, in Jordan offer PhD uh, programs and mainly in humanities. For example, in biology, uh, there is only one university in Jordan that offers PhD programs. Uh, my university does not offer PhD programs for different reasons. We can discuss this later, but this is where we fall short. So we offer undergraduate programs, a lot of undergraduate programs. We offer many, many master degree programs, but we fall short in PhD, very few PhD programs like in biology, math, uh, physics, only one or two universities in Jordan offer PhD programs. Next, please. Um, again, as I said, uh, education uh, is a, a huge economic resource for Jordan. We have more than 44,000 international students in Jordan, but again, 90% or even more than that, 90, I think 94% of these students are pursuing their undergraduate, not graduate degrees. Uh, next, please. Thank you. Um, now let's focus on, on research. Uh, Jordan, just like the other Middle Eastern uh, countries, uh, except for, uh, for uh, Israel, uh, and I'm not sure even if it is considered in the Middle East, maybe geographically speaking. Um, we, of course, we fall below the world uh, expenditure on research and development. So I have some figures for you in 2002, the, uh, how we spent on research and development, and we are talking about all levels of research. We are talking about basic, applied, and translational, only 0.34% versus 2% worldwide. Uh, the percentage increased, but not that much over the years. Uh, the last uh, survey we have is 0.7% in Jordan. And that's, uh, and I got some numbers from Gulf uh, countries like Kuwait and Qatar, who have, um, you know, these are oil producing countries. So they have money, but still uh, in terms of research and development, they are not different from Jordan, which is, considered at uh, middle to low uh, uh, income countries. Uh, so research and development is not really uh, a very good focus for um, Jordanian universities. We fall below uh, the world expenditure. Um, next, please. Thank you, again. Uh, and that reflects on the number of publications by Jordanian researchers. So I just have these two figures for you to compare. Um, in 2018, uh, Chinese researchers published more than uh, half a million of papers. Uh, American researchers, almost uh, half a million. If you compare that to Jordanian researchers, we are talking about 2,500 articles from half a million to 2,500. And that again reflects uh, why research is not really a focus of Jordan. Next, please. One more. Okay. Um, the main um, funding agency for research uh, in Jordan is something called Scientific Research Support Fund. And just to, for comparison purposes, this is very close to NIH or NSF in the US. Um, this is a public uh, funded uh, agency. Uh, any researcher in Jordan, whether uh, they are working in public or private university or in an institute or industry, they can apply for it and they can get funded. Um, again, uh, once we are done with this, you can ask me uh, if the money is the problem. Uh, I can assure you that money is not really the problem behind uh, weak research and publication. Next, please. 
So in addition to this scientific research support fund, we have privately funded uh, organization or institute. Uh, one of them is Abdel Hamid Shoman Foundation that support research. And this has been going in Jordan for uh, more than 40 years. Next, please. Uh, we have collaboration, just like any other country, we have collaboration with, you, uh, with Europe to support uh, research funding. We have uh, something called Higher Council for Science and Technology that supports uh, research uh, in Jordan. One of the uh, biggest successes in Jordan is this uh, European funded uh, program called Tempus. And this supports professional development and exchange of uh, researchers, but this does not support scientific research. Uh, mainly it supports uh, professional development. Next, please. Again, uh, and also uh, we can apply um, for funding from our own uh, universities through the Deanship of Scientific Research. Uh, every uh, university in Jordan, whether we are talking about public or private, um, they have this deanship of scientific research. You can apply for it uh, and you can get uh, funded through the deanship of uh, scientific research. So money is not really uh, an issue. Um, next, please. So uh, in conclusion, uh, scientific research in Jordan is still very, uh, very weak. Uh, funding is very, very competitive, but money is not really uh, the issue. It's um, the issue is more of bureaucracy. Um, the research exchange is one way. Jordanian researchers go abroad. We go to Europe. We go to US for research uh, opportunities and not the other way around. Uh, Fulbright, we have Fulbright collaboration, but it is again one way. Um, Jordanian researchers go abroad, not the other way around. I think in the last 20 years, I only heard of two Fulbright researchers coming from the US or Europe to Jordan. Um, so it is still very weak. Uh, PhD programs are um, not the strongest point in Jordan. We are working uh, on it and we will see in the coming five years if more PhD programs will be uh, established in Jordan. Um, that's it. Thank you. Just to remind you about the third um, webinar for this uh, series. Great. Thank you, Ludna. Again, questions welcome uh, at the bottom, the Q&A section. Uh, I would like to ask you, Lubna, the same thing I asked the other uh, panelists about the uh, language barrier for non-native mm. non speakers. Can you comment on that, please? Uh, so in order for Jordanian universities to stay accredited, um, especially in scientific disciplines, we teach in English. We only teach in English. We don't teach in Arabic. So uh, biology, math, physics, medicine, pharmaceutical sciences, we, we teach in English, we don't teach in Arabic. So language is not really a barrier. Okay, and in terms of uh, application is, again, can you comment on the timing of the year, what the, what the cycle is like for that? Uh, it is, we follow the American system, exactly the American system. So whatever the American universities do, we follow that. So uh, our students apply for the fall semester, uh, one, one, almost one year um, earlier and so on. So it is ex almost exactly the American system. Okay, thanks. And uh, you'd mentioned that there are uh, a number of non-nationals that are, are there. Uh, can you comment on the, the competitiveness of the applications for those coming from outside of Georgia? Yeah, so um, right now we have, we are hosting like my department, the biology department at the Hashemite University. We have a Fulbright a scholar who is working right now at the department. Um, you know, with Fulbright, you need to apply at least two years earlier from the time you wanna, you wanna start. Uh, it is not really that hard. It is not that difficult. We, um, uh, we encourage everybody to come and that would give us so that we can start this two-way exchange because as I mentioned, it's a one-way. 
right now. Jordanian researchers going abroad, but in order to increase the focus on research and development in Jordan, we need researchers from abroad to come over. And we uh, encourage researchers to come over. We can, our university will pay their uh, salaries and they can support their research. Okay, well, that all sounds very good. Thank you very much, Ludna. Uh, so that is the conclusion of our panelists today. Uh, again, I wanna thank uh, Fernanda and Niels and Lubna for being with us today as speakers. Uh, thank you as an audience uh, for participating with us. Uh, we do have one final question uh, from the audience to the uh, to Niels from Brazil. Is international workshop and conference attendance financially supported if you are a PhD student? Okay, very good. Thanks for this last question. Yes, um, and we have quite a lot of opportunity to have these students among us. So again. Each program, they usually have winter or summer school where the students can come and we can pay uh, for this short visit here in Brazil. Uh, and this is very welcome here. Um, as the Lubina said, we also have, and I forgot to mention, some fellowships from our own university. Most of them go to postdoc position, but uh, we are about to open position for PhD also that can be paid by the university. So, yeah, very nice. Great, thank you very much. So again, concluding today, uh, please join us for our third and final uh, webinar in this series, which will be on November 15th. Uh, that's gonna be India, Switzerland, and the United States. Thank you very much. Have a good day.